Welcome to This Week in Hearing and our special series on giants in audiology. Oh, I'm Bob Trader, your host for this episode. And today is my special guest, Dr. Robert Disogra, former owner of Audiology Associates of Freehold and an adjunct professor at many universities. His, his work is known for hearing and hearing rehabilitation, a lot of work in private and practice management, uh, but he's really famous for implementation of pharmacology into audiology. Thanks so much for being with us today, Bob, and uh, appreciate your, your participation in the Giants in Audiology series. Thank you, Bob. First, let me uh, let me tell you uh, to say how flattered I am and how honored I am to be uh, amongst other giants in audiology that you have interviewed. Uh, persons whose books I've I've purchased, whose articles I've read, whose lectures I've attended, and whose friendships developed because of that. And uh, it, it's it's a it's a true honor for me to uh, to be here. And I'm I'm excited uh, that you found my uh, my professional history of interest to be included here. Well, the first thing I like to do is is read your professional bio. And so that's where we're going to start this morning right. is with the professional bio. So, so it reads as Bob is a retired New Jersey audiologist from Millstone, New Jersey. His 45-year career, Bob has worked in a variety of audiology settings, including industrial, clinical, research, teaching, and one of my areas, private practice as well, which is uh, which he owned his practice now for 30 years in Freehold, New Jersey, until 2015. Bob received his Doctor of Audiology degree from the Osborne College of Audiology at Salus University, where he actually developed and taught the Pharmacology Ototoxicity Distance Learning Course. He holds a master's degree in audiology from Hofstra University and a Bachelor of Science degree in speech education from St. John's University. He has an extensive undergraduate, graduate, and doctoral level teaching experience, a publication and lecture history, both nationally and internationally, on pharmacology and ototoxicity diabetes related hearing loss and over-the-counter dietary supplements for hearing loss and tinnitus. Bob has served the audiology uh, community as the consultant to the audiology project, which led our profession to being added to the Centers for Disease Control list of allied health professions as experts who manage diabetes-related hearing loss. So, uh, so quite a, a orientation, a, a very nice bio, but how did all this start? I mean, now can we talk a little about the early years, Bob? Uh, most of us didn't start off at, uh, doing all these things we've been doing over, over our careers. We had to start someplace. And my understanding is you kind of, Started up in the in the New England area. Well, actually, it was New York. I, I was born and raised on Staten Island, and uh, did my uh, my my grammar school education uh, at Sacred Heart School, uh, Catholic school, and uh, and during that time, um, yeah, just I was a kid, you know, just growing up in the 1950s, you know, a very typical. Uh, post World War II baby boomer type of family with I had three other siblings, a, a younger sister and an older brother and sister. And uh, my mom and dad got us all involved in playing musical instruments and uh, you know just just being kids. And uh, I've developed a bit of an interest in singing and also an interest in motorsports and stock car racing as a young kid. Uh, which led to something even further down the road, uh, which I'll address later on. And uh, and during grammar school, what was interesting, um, I was not aware of this. And in the 1950s, if you had any type of learning disability, uh, any academic problems that you ran into were basically your problem. 
Okay, it was if you could not keep up with what the teacher was teaching, something was wrong with you. You were not studying hard enough. Uh, you you have to buckle down. You know, you had all these abstract types of phrases that were like the words were like Swiss cheese to me. But uh, I had an undiagnosed learning disability that came to a head by the time I was in seventh grade, where I had my first summer school experience uh, for math. And uh, I did graduate um, uh, grammar school and uh, was accepted into an all boys academic Catholic high school where my older brother had attended and was very successful. And during that time, uh, the, uh, the strategies that I used to get through grammar school, I brought into high school. And those strategies of studying and learning just failed dramatically. Uh, I wound up uh, in summer school, uh, freshman year into sophomore year uh, for like four classes, uh, mostly sciences, language. Uh, I failed an open book test in French. Um, very, very challenging time. Sophomore year, same type of problems going on with uh, language and math, science, and uh, like science took biology. Okay, I passed the lab, hands on, real time, instant gratification, show me type of learning. <laughs> okay. But the academics, I failed. So I had to go to summer school for the academics, even though I passed the lab. And uh, sophomore year into junior year was also four more subjects that had to be repeated. And, uh, you know, taking foreign languages, in addition, I, I took Latin, I took French, and just I just could not function very well. Uh, I even tried to fail out of school deliberately, so I would not have to put myself through all this aggravation, which created a lot of conflict with my parents. And um, But the school kept me in, and, uh, and I eventually graduated in the bottom half of my class in high school, 1967. And as you know, in 1967, if you were 17, 18 years of age with the Vietnam War the way it was, and you were not in college, you were going to be in the Army. It was not negotiable. So well, you're either in college or you didn't flunk out of college, like some of us had. Well, had what happened, happened. I, I took those same horrible you know, learning strategies and study skills that, that got me, that somehow got me through high school. I brought them into college. Uh, my brother and sister both went away to college. I wound up staying at home because I could only I only got into one college, which was St. John's University. They had a two year school of general studies. Basically, it was for kids that had the potential, but they just didn't have the academics to really get into the four year school. So I went into the two year college. I had my student deferment from uh, the military. And again, it was like going to a glorified high school. I was commuting. I was living at home, uh, had a girlfriend, had a car. I was working part time as a driver for a florist. And, uh, you know, it was like, this is not right. Something is just not connecting over here. So after two years at St. John's, um, I got a nice letter from the dean that says, like, thank you for your two years at St. John's, but you're out of here. So I was <laughs> academically disqualified. I was academically disenrolled. AKA wow. got thrown out of college, lost my student deferment from the military a month later. And I was 19 now. Okay. So, you know, where all 19 year olds were going in 1969. Oh, so, sure. Um, that's when I went into the Navy. That's when I went into the Navy. And now, just, now, before we get to the Navy, Bob, I understand that you had kind of a interesting experience with a really famous baseball player. Yeah. As a young kid. <laughs> Yeah, I completely forgot that. Thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Um, my dad was president of the Italian club on Staten Island in the 1950s. And Phil Rizzuto from the New York Yankees had just retired. And he was the guest speaker at, the, at this awards dinner that they had. And what had happened is that my dad made sure that I had my picture taken with Phil Rizzuto. So here I am. And I was like eight years old, nine years old. I'm, you know, I have my shirt and tie and my suit on. And I've got my picture taken, black and white, standing next to Phil Rosetta. It was a posed picture, just the two of us. This has been a treasured picture for me. Fast forward, he gets into the Hall of Fame in 1994. And I said, I got to get this picture autographed. Well, fast forward, it wasn't until like 10, 11 years later when he, he lives in New Jersey. And it turns out that he was going to be nearby at a sports uh, store signing autographs. So I made arrangements with the owner. I told him what was going on. I said, it's... I want to, it's a personal picture. I'd like to get an updated picture with him. And they said, not a problem. So of course, you know, it, it, it wasn't free, but that's not the point. The point was that we were going to get together again. 
And uh, and I had a picture taken. Well, when I met him, he, I told him the story that we met at the Italian club in Staten Island, you know, back in the 50s. So I showed him the picture and he looks at the picture and he looks up at me and he says, your hair is different. Well, cl- and plus I was following <laughs> another foot over at that time. And it was a treasured, treasured picture that I have. And we, and so I got the picture signed and we, we took the picture. And uh, so now I have two pictures of me and Phil Rizzuto, 1957 and 1985 in the wow. same position, but I'm a bit taller than the guy. Um, well, yeah. but, and I also understand that, that you had uh, some, some roles in, in things like the Music Man and yeah. Finnegan's in Rainbow, these kinds of things in high school that were that were kind of uh, you know the other side of the brain kinds sure. of things that yeah. worked really well for you. My brother sang in the Glee Club uh, when he was. My brother Charles was three years older than I, and he was in the Glee Club. And when I became a freshman, he was a senior, and he was president of the Glee Club. You know, and like a little brother, you follow in your big brother's footsteps. So I joined the Glee Club. And at the time, uh, they started doing Broadway shows. And, uh, you know, they did Oklahoma. And then the following year, they did The Music Man. And I decided, well, I'm in the Glee Club. Let me try out for one of the parts. Well, I got the part of the bass in the Barbershop Quartet. And that's when I fell in love with Barbershop music. And that's when, you know, I, I was singing in the church choir. And that's when I fell in love with Renaissance music. So now you start to see the musical background coming into play here with harmonies and, and all that other good stuff, you know, which led me to the organization of the Audiology Chorus, which sings the national anthem at the AAA every year. Sure. Yeah, that's down the road. So, so I, I sang in the barbershop quartet at the Music Man. I played the sheriff in Finian's Rainbow. They let me grow my hair long at school, which was unheard of in a Catholic school back in the day. <laughs> I was a sheriff, you know. We didn't have money. Of course. So, so you know, having done all that, uh, it was just a lot of fun. The music was there. Uh, I was still going to the stock car races if I could on Saturday nights. I was working for a fourth. I was just doing kind of stuff that you do as a teenager, just having some fun, you know. But the serious thing with Vietnam hanging over your head, you know, just really kind of changed the course for a lot of a lot of people in my age group. And uh, so, uh, so you know, I, I finally graduated and, you know, got into St. John's, got out of St. John's. And, uh, and that's when I went to the Navy. And, you know, I had this academic difficulty. I knew I was smart. Or so I thought, uh, but I knew I had a learning style that was different than the teacher's teaching style. And that was something that came to a head when I was in the Navy. I learned in the Navy that I am a hands-on, real-time, show-me, instant gratification kind of learner. So the Navy sent me to radar school, and I got involved in radar and electronics and communications and radar mm-hmm. navigation and charts. Everything was visual, it was real-time, it was instant gratification. It was bang, 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 cookbook, step by step by step. And I fell into a groove that my time in the Navy went faster than most other people because it was always going on, always moving something. Well, as my time in the Navy was getting short, I decided to reapply to St. John's and say, hey, give me a second chance. You know, there was like a four year gap between sophomore and junior year. And they, they reaccepted me back in. So they took me back in on probation. So my season. Now, but I also kind of understand that before you went to the Navy, you also took some time on some ships out in the out in the wilderness and uh and they had some of those some of those kind of jobs that that all of us have on our way to where we're we hopefully will end up someplace right you know my my dad obviously sensed you know that i i needed something to do i needed maybe to get away so what happened is that uh he 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 knew someone that was involved with um, uh, commercial cargo shipping and passenger ships in the New York area. One thing led to another, and I wound up joining the National Maritime Union at the ripe old age of 17. And one week after I graduated high school, I am now working as a bellboy on the SS Constitution, a passenger liner, three weeks transatlantic into the Mediterranean, Portugal, Spain, France, Italy, North Africa. I am... 17 years old, my first time away from home, and I'm doing room service, getting 25 cents here, 50 cents there. Well, I did two of those trips in the summer of 67 and uh, made some nice money, bought some clothes for college. And then the, in the summer of 68, uh, I went back to the National Maritime Union and got a job working on the, uh, the SS United States. And it was interesting. Um, one of the jobs that I had was cleaning the main 
ballroom on the ship. Okay. I had to just clean the ashtrays, polish the bright work, buff the floors and so on. Well, the bartenders left the soda machine on. And th this is something that I still remember to this day. And, and, I, and, and, it, and I'd like to tell this story because it, it's inspirational. It, to me, it was at the time. And to me, it still is to this day. So here I am, uh, you know, I'm in college. I had the academic stuff going on, you know, and I'm just, you know, I'm working as a porter doing maintenance work and cleaning and so on. Not exactly the stuff I wanted to do, but nonetheless, it was a job. And, uh, and I'm in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean somewhere. And in 1967, um, a lot of people uh, you know, traveled by ship before you know, jet travel would, became as advanced as it was. And there were not a lot of black people on these ships. So I, I, I'm sitting at the bar by myself, it's three o'clock in the morning, and this black gentleman walks in wearing a tuxedo, sits down next to me at the bar and looks at me and he points his finger, is this your regular job? I said, no, I said, I'm in college, you know, I wanted to be a high school English teacher at the time. And he looked at me and he points his finger and he goes, stay in school, because instead of cleaning up after the party, you'll be at the party. And he got up and he left. Bob, I never saw this guy before that night on this three-week trip. I never saw him again after that night. And you know how people say an angel comes into your life every once in a while to guide you? Yeah. That was my angel. Wow. That was my angel. And I can't begin to tell you how many times I recall that story. And now later on in my life, at my age, now I'm telling that story to other young people. Stay in school instead of, you know... Instead of cleaning up after the party, you'd be at the party. And it was like, wow, what what an epiphany for me. And so on. Well, anyway, I knew that so, was such a such a big one. We didn't we didn't want to miss that in this chronological kind of a thing. And and now now my understanding is that a lot of the things that you were doing in the Navy kind of was an kind of an inspiration to kind of move into uh audiology once you got back in school. Uh, that and a, to, and a serious mentor as well. Yeah, once I got back into school, I met Donna Geffner. And uh, Dr. Geffner was my mentor. She, uh, PhD, uh, speech language pathologist, audiologist, at uh, City University of New York. And, uh, you know, she was at St. John's. And uh, she saw that I was a returning student. I was older than most of the other juniors at the time. And uh, she kind of took me under her wing. And uh, and she saw that I would had more potential as an audiologist. Now, we just had the introduction audiology class. We had a, you know, a small little booth, little audiometer, little bell tone audiometer, hands on real time instant gratification. You know, it was like, wow, being back in the Navy again. But the only difference, as I told you before, is that in audiology, the floor doesn't move, <laughs> so, which was nice. So I didn't have to worry about having a bucket next to me getting seasick while I was trying to track ships in the middle of the ocean. So, uh, so, so Donna took me under her wing and she says, you're going to be an audiologist. And from that point on, she mentored me into the profession. And, uh, and, and, then, uh, I, and then when I graduated St. John's and I went into Hofstra, uh, you know, she was very, very supportive through the whole thing. And uh, when I and she still stayed at St. John's. And when I graduated Hofstra, when I graduated Hofstra, after all was said and done, Donna was doing a program. She was doing a, a series of programs at, C, at at NBC in New York. Uh, and NBC New York had a, um, a, a the morning show. This is before 24 hour news and all these other shows like the farmer shows would be on early in the morning. Well, this was a 10 part series called Our Incredible Gifts speech and hearing. And for 10 half hour programs without commercial, Donna had specialists from the air, from the fields of speech pathology and audiology that she interviewed. And they had, uh, they had video and things like that. And it was, you know, just an educational program for the community, for, for people watching at that hour. And it was six o'clock in the morning. Um, and, and they just talked about, you know, speech and hearing disorders and identification, intervention, management, and the like. One of the guests was Jerry Norton. Okay, and I had just had Jerry's book and so on like that, you know, and, and to me, Jerry was gone, like, you know, I am not worthy. You know? <laughs> so, and and Jerry was an absolute sweetheart, you know, he was just- yeah, Join the club, like, man. Right. Yeah. Then, and then I found out that these other people were regular people, you know, and it's like, these are nice people. And, um, you know, so and that was my first contact with Jerry was through Donna, through doing these TV shows. And uh, and we, we had a, a, quite a large number of well-known people that she took on the show. One of the shows, the show that they did on stuttering, 
was nominated for New York, uh, New York Academy of Arts and Sciences Emmy Award. Uh, we didn't win, but we got nominated, and that was fun, you know. So, yeah. uh, so Hofstra rolled around, and Hofstra came and went. Uh, NBC was a terrific experience for the two weeks that I was with them in New York. Uh, I was working as their technical consultant. I was back with the producer, the director, and the people with the blue book, making sure that ethics, everything was said okay. And uh, it was just wonderful. And uh, Donna and I, we still talk about that experience back. That was 1977. And uh, so I, I, I got a job working, a combination of working for an environmental acoustic, an acoustic engineering company and Mountainside Hospital, get the CFY taken care of. And the they had the uh, the acoustical engineering, acoustic engineering company had a van. And uh, so they were doing, you know, we were doing hearing screenings, industrial noise surveys and that kind of stuff. Got my first publication from that. And that was pretty flattering for me. Because, wow, I just got published, you know. And um and so, so I started getting interested in industrial audiology. So I got the, so I finished the CFY, and then I got uh, there was an application, there was job opening JFK Medical Center in Edison, New Jersey, and they wanted three to five years experience. I had one year experience; it was my CFY, you know. And I was really desperate. I really, I almost went back into the Navy because like other jobs were just not happening. So I went on the interview, and um, you know, I thought it was a good interview. Came back home. Two days later, I get a phone call saying that they hired somebody else. And it was interesting because they hired Robert DeSogre, not Bob DeSogre. They hired Robert DeSogre. <laughs> so they told me, Bob DeSogre, I didn't get the job uh, because Robert DeSogre got the job. And uh, so I got the job. And when I went to Human Resources and so on, they told me, they said, we had other people here, okay, that had much more experience than you. And the reason why we hired you is that because you were a Navy veteran. I said, whoa, whoa. You know, and that was like, that I, that came out of the blow. I did not know that the, the respect that they had for my service in the Navy brought me into this audiology job, which I stayed in for like seven years. And uh, so I was a clinical audiologist for seven years at, at this medical center. And it was time to move on. And like any other job, you know, you get your point time to move on. And down in Princeton, there was a biomedical research company called Biostim that was doing cochlear implant phase two cochlear implant research with Blair Simmons, the late Dr. Blair Simmons at Stanford. Yeah. I, I was living maybe a half hour from Princeton. So one thing led to another. I have dinner with the president of the company. And he said, like, you know, write up a job description and it's yours. And basically, that's how I got this. So I left JFK, went to work for this biomedical research company, doing phase two clinical trials, traveling around the country, trying to get doctors to come on board as co-investigators. And it started getting my interest in all this research and stuff. It was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed it, but I really missed seeing the patients. So what I did is that I said, you know, I need a break. I have nine years in audiology, almost 10 years. I got to step away. You know, something's just not working right here. So I had friends of mine have rock and roll bass. The rock and roll. Let me, let, <laughs> well, we'll look we'll at that just just in a second here, Bob. But you know that one of the things that 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 uh, that also I think is, is says a lot for yourself is the the acceptance at Penn State for the PhD program. But um, you you we we've talked a little bit about some extenuating circumstances and things like that that didn't no. allow you to go. But but I know that 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 was. That was a pretty motivating kind of a thing for you as well as in our discussion. It was, you know, because I, I, I knew I had I, I knew I had a learning style that was successful. However, the academic environments that I was in in grammar school, high school and in college did not meet, did not teach the way I learned. OK, and, and I carried that into my clinical practice and working with children and with auditory processing disorders. And because, like I said, I'm a hands on, show me visual structured cookbook kind of learner. And uh, and, and now I, I come out of the Navy. I get back into St. John's. I finally get my bachelor's degree. I get a master's degree. And like Donna is saying, Bob, you got to go on for your doctorate. Mark Kramer, who was my mentor at, at Hofstra, you know, like I said, go for it. You know, you're, you're this is what you want to do. And I applied uh, to Penn State and a few other schools, and, and Penn State offered me a scholarship um, at, with a stipend. And, um, you know, so, you know, I, I mean, this was like flat. Like, I can't believe this has happened. This is in my life, a PhD scholarship when, you know, 
six years earlier, I'm academically just you know, thrown out of St. John's for being academically unqualified. <laughs> you know, this was, it finally came to a head. Uh, things in my life at the time were a little chaotic, uh, like everybody has. And um, I had to give up the seat. Reluctantly, I had to give up the seat. And uh, by giving up the seat, it, it made me kind of rethink a focus on where I wanted to go. And, uh, and then I said, you know, I'm going to try private practice. I'm going to try private. But, you know, being Before accepted I, in a being accepted in a in a prestigious uh, prestigious PhD program is a is a great motivator for uh, for, for for people and uh, probably allowed the contributions a, a lot for the, all the extra learning that we had to learn uh, mm -hmm. as as audiologists yep. to move from from uh, into into assessment for central auditory uh, difficulties and all the other other specific things that we had to learn as changes. I mean, we all had to learn about ABR. We all had to learn about OAEs. We all had to learn about a lot of these things we never even heard of. In fact, almost were a figment of everyone's imagination when we were in school. So um, so I know that, that, that that was a huge motivator to bring a person through the some of the, the, the positions you just mentioned as well as then uh, taking this break that mm -hmm. allows a, those breaks kind of allow you to kind of look at look at everything from a you know uh, a thirty thousand foot view where you can kind mm -hmm. of look at this and this and this and all these things and my understanding is uh, you were kind of a race car guy at Talladega and some of those places and had this band and uh, yeah, and no, a few no, things none of my played, played the sax like uh, <laughs> like a crazy guy and all these kinds of things so. Uh, it was one of those things where I had friends of mine had a rock and roll band, a cover band that played down the Jersey Shore. I spent most of my summers in summer school. OK, most of my summers working and I never really had a real summer vacation uh, until after I left uh, Biostem in 1985. So the summer of 85, I just said, you know, I'm going to hang up the audiology for a while. These this, this rock and roll, but these guys were friends of mine. I, they knew I played the saxophone and I just said, can I just have some therapy? Can I just come out and hang out with you guys and play? And it's don't even pay me. I said, like, you know, cause I, I, I did well at Biostim. I said, I don't even pay me. I said, like, you know, just one. So I, I basically joined this rock and roll band down the Jersey Shore that was a house band and, and a bar down in Stone Harbor, New Jersey. And it was the craziest summer of my life. And then I said, you know, I got to get back to audiology. One of the things that we did, which was a lot of fun, because I brought audiology into the into the show that they did. They had a whole Motown show. And one of the things that they did, oh. they did My Girl by The Temptations. So they're doing My Girl. I got up and I started signing My Girl. And it turns out that every night they would do the show and every night I would sign My Girl. And then the regulars would be there, you know, at two o'clock in the morning with big buzzes on it and they're trying to sign My Girl with me. <laughs> and it was, and, and to this day, there are people that I still stay in touch with. They say, you know, every time I hear My Girl, I think of you up on the stage doing all this stuff in sign language. Crazy, absolutely crazy. But it refocused me to say that, you know, audiology is really for me. This is this is my this is my calling. And then, you know, so I, I, I went down to Alabama. I, I did the stock car racing. I got to know some drivers and stuff. You know, I did some hearing conservation work, you know, but I really needed to be back and seeing patients and, and being involved in the evaluating and diagnostics, rehabilitation in the babies, the children, the adults, just like I did at the medical center. Uh, a couple of years earlier. And that was my calling, but I never ran a business before. So that was on the job training. And, um, you know, almost gave that up, but I said, like, I'm going to just pursue it. And I did and um, survived 30 years in Freehold, met some wonderful people, celebrities, um, people all different walks of life that didn't want to be in my office, but the hearing loss you know, got them there and uh, did my best to uh, to improve the quality of their lives. But when I started to see kids with auditory processing problems and I started saying, like, I remember that. I remember that. You know, I remember my parents doing that. Well, when I turned 50, what I did is that I got I, I, I went to a psychiatrist. OK. And I who was specializing in learning disabilities. And uh, and I told him what was going on. I had just got my AUD. And I said, like, how did I get here? How did I get here after all that stuff, you know, and, and now with the doctoral degree, you know, and, you know, and with all the learning issues that I described earlier, 
And, uh, you know, and so I went on the evaluation and then he sent me to a, a, a neuropsychologist and um, it was like two days of testing. And uh, went through the two days of testing. I can't do word problems. To this day, I can't do word problems. One, word problems is one of the subtests in this thing. I gave the paper right back to the psychiatrist. I said, I'm not doing this. I said, I can't do these things. <laughs> Just writing the notes yeah. down. Well, what happened, I knew that I had this learning problem, but it was never formally diagnosed. Guess what? ADD, APD, okay, no hearing loss, but all of the behaviors that are classic of attention deficit disorder in adults and auditory processing in adults that I had 50 years ago, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, whatever, okay? It all came to a head and I cried. I'm reading this report and it's like, okay, there it is. And from that moment on, whenever we had parents and the kids come in, I tell them that story. So like, your kid is gonna do okay. Margie and Charlie DeSoga's kid did okay. It's a road less traveled and it's a learning style that may not be in sync with the teacher's teaching style. And I think that's what we have to focus on. And I've gotten fruit baskets. I've gotten wonderful letters from parents that, you know, that all these different things, you know, changed their child's attitude towards school. So that came full circle because I remember in grammar school, the principal of my grammar school told my parents flat out, he's not college material. And so when I got the award for alumnus of the year at Salus, which I was very flattered that that they they recognized that, you know, uh, uh, they said, well, you have to, you know, just say a few words, dedicate it, you know, normal stuff. And I said, who am I going to dedicate it to? My parents? You know, what? I said, no, I'm going to dedicate this to the principal that told my parents that I'm not college material because <laughs> that was an incentive to prove this lady was wrong. OK, and yeah. I did. So there. OK, so. Well, and, and I so, understand that uh, that your time at Salus was was pretty significant for you as well with, you know, George, uh, George Osborne was oh, one of gosh. your mentors yeah. and. You know, as, as he was a mentor to many of us also. Well, what so, had happened when I had the private practice, I was, I, I took a part-time job teaching at, at, uh, at Rutgers University, okay, in the speech and hearing department. Uh, I was asked to, if I wanted to teach the undergraduate anatomy and physiology for speech and hearing, in addition to the introduction audiology class. And, uh, and I said, fine, it's not a problem. So I, I was able to supplement that with the, you know, the ups and downs of private practice, especially early on. So what had happened, one of the honor students, one of the honor students came out to me and, and she said to me, she goes, I'd like to do a program. I'd like to do a report on how drugs affect hearing. I said, well, OK, so I'm going to mention her name. Kristen Weir was her name. And uh, and Kristen was really interested in learning about how the drug goes from your mouth to the right part of the brain, to the correct area where she was just, you know, just interested in this stuff. So we really sat down and we said, okay, let's take a look at uh, the drugs that we know that can cause hearing loss. Because back in the 19, I guess, I guess you know, late uh, 70s, you know, everything was like ototoxicity. Okay, but we never really looked at the side effects of the other drugs that could have the same effect on vestibular testing and things like cognition and so on. So, so what we did, um, I went through the drugs. She did all the other. Uh, research on, you know, on, 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 on absorption and liver rates and all sorts of stuff. And uh, we put this thing together and it was really a great paper that she did. I just did the, uh, the, the appendix. So I told her, you know, I'm going to submit this to audiology today and I'm going to see if we can get this published. And I did. John Jacobson was the editor of audiology today at the time. And, uh, and he said, Hey, yeah, we're going to do it. So this was like, I guess, 1997. Okay. Fast forward, the AUD comes around, okay? And it's all distance learning back in 1999, 2000. I got to know George Osborne because I was one of the co-founders of the New Jersey Academy of Audiology, and George was starting up with the Pennsylvania Academy of Audiology. So, so George and I had some contact back and forth, and then he tells me that the Pennsylvania College of Optology is going to have an AUD program. And then he's describing the program, the six weeks on, two weeks off, you know, and the cost and so on. And he's rattling off all the incredible courses and, you know, and he says pharmacology, ototoxicity. And I said, well, who's going to be teaching that? Because I thought Kathy Campbell was going to be teaching that because she was our, and still is, you know, my 
you know, my mentor uh, for pharmacology ototoxicity. And then George said to me, he says, wait a second, Bob. So you had that paper published back in 96, 97 on the drug side effects. He goes, why don't you teach the class? I said, George, I, I don't know that much about pharmacology. I've been in private practice all these years. And he said, Bob, if you were to go back to school and take a pharmacology ototoxicity course for six weeks, just six weeks, what would you want to learn in private practice? And I said, gee, you know, and I kind of thought about it. And I said, I'd want to learn this, 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 and this as a private practitioner. And he goes, great, that's the class. Let's get it going. And that's how it started at PCL. And now wow. a couple of weeks later, I'm teaching a pharmacology class online. Of course, I'm one page ahead of the class, you know, but again, it was one of those things that it was brand new for the profession. And there were only a handful of schools at the time, and not many of them had pharmacology in the country. Not even today do well, they have. That, that yeah. leads to a task force that AAA had a couple of years ago that I was asked to be on. And it was during that time that, you know, we looked at pharmacology education and, uh, you know, in the profession. And it was it was kind of an overview. It was good. Some really good people were there. Um, and, and what we wanted to do was to see, you know, where, where does pharmacology fit in audiology? Okay. So, so what had happened is while I'm doing the private practice, while I'm doing the distance learning, I get the AUD in 2003, the task force going on, Kathy Campbell's doing some wonderful stuff in clinical trials uh, with, uh, with her work out there in Illinois. And, um, you know, what George said to me, he goes, Bob, why don't you update the list when I started the program in 2000? Because why don't you update that list from 97? And the number of drugs tripled. The number of side effects on the list doubled. Okay. And, and Jerry Northern at the time was the editor of Audiology Today. And uh, so I submitted it, the whole the updated list of Audiology Today. And I submitted it to Jerry, blah, 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 the whole thing. And Jerry gets back to me and goes, Bob, he says, you know, this is too big. He goes, I can't do this in the pages of audiology today. He says, what we're going to do is that we're going to put a special issue out. And it's going to be a dedicated issue towards pharmacology and ototoxicity. And your drug list and the side effect reference list is going to be that special issue. Now, this was in 2000. 2001 rolls around, 9-11 rolls around. And the special issue, which was supposed to come out in September 2001, uh, gets uh, gets printed in, in 2002, in January of 2002. And now every audiologist that's a member of, of AAA now has a special issue of, of drug side effects, of, of all, you know, drugs that could affect hearing, balance, cognition, vascular uh, issues, okay? And anything related to speech and hearing, perception, cognition, auditory processing, these drugs were listed and the side effects uh, were right there. That became a springboard. That became a springboard because now I'm getting phone calls from state academies, state speech and hearing associations. We'd like you to come on out, talk more about this, talk more about that. And uh, so I have to thank Jerry Northern. I have to thank Jerry Northern for recognizing that work and putting it in a special issue. I think AAA only had maybe eight or nine special issues ever, okay, that they published. And this is one of them. And uh, and flatter. Oh, geez. I was like, this is wonderful. Thank you. I got thrown out for being academic and qualified. Now I got a special issue in audiology today from the American Academy of Audiology. You know, and it's like, wow, wow, that none was wrong. And um, so we got the uh, we got that done. And this was in 2001. I graduated in 2003. And the lecture series started, the teaching started, you know, the, all this adjunct stuff started, which was wonderful, very flattering. Got it to had the private practice. So I'm kind of like wearing two hats over here. Yeah. Then I had so many requests for a third edition. And in 2008, a third edition came out. And that third edition had over 2,000 drugs, um, you know, 315 side effects that an audiologist would be interested in. 315. It's not just hearing loss and tinnitus. Okay. Yeah, they're on the list, but there were 313 others. Okay. So this is springboarding into the whole thing as far as, you know, my position uh, in the profession uh, with this background in pharmacology. From that, what springboarded was the over-the-counter supplements yeah. 
who are tinnitus that, that were already out there. And, and I don't think people understand just how significant these supplements might be. Because when we first started talking about this, you know, we talked about all the drugs and that, those kinds of things and, and watched how that, that, that uh, publication kind of stuff just went up and up and up and up. The lectures went up and up and up. But um, the supplements are probably just as big of a problem as, the, as some of the medications themselves, from what I understand. Absolutely. And, there's, and what's happened here, there's a, personal, there's a personal story here. And I have to thank my wife, Suzanne, for this. Um, not that I'm thanking her because of her hearing loss and tinnitus, but yeah. because of the noise. Coincidentally, out of the blue, I get this box in the mail of 12 bottles of lipoflavonoid. Okay. And with a little information sheet about, you know, try this with your patients who have tinnitus. And there was an information sheet and there were references on the back. So I brought a bottle home and I spoke to my wife. I said, yeah, they want you to take three a day. Okay. And let's see what happens. And Suzanne, a little, she's a little more conservative than I am. She goes, no, I'm going to do one a day. Okay. So I do one a day, see what happens. Okay. So she starts doing the lipoflavonoid once a day. Okay. And, you know, and I'm checking how you're doing, blah, 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 like that. Well, about a month after she started this whole thing, she develops kidney stones. And I see like, what? You know, nothing changed in her diet. Nothing changed at all, except we started to add this supplement. And then I started looking at the list of the references that came with the supplement that was supporting the evidence, their evidence. Everything was on Meniere's disease, and there was nothing past 1965 in the literature. And this was like, this was like 2005. No, I'm sorry, 2012 or something like that. Wow. And it's like, this is 40 year old data and they're marketing it. And one thing led to, and I started looking at the ingredients in lipoflavin in this, you know, in this drug, none of them, there was no published research at all on the specific ingredients that were in the pill. And then I started thinking, well, what else is out there? And with the internet, I just started putting like supplements, tinnitus supplements, or supplements for tinnitus. And all of a sudden, I have like 45 products that came up. And then, so what I said is like, I'm going to go see what's in these products. And one thing led to another and um, got a larger publication out of that. And uh, this was privately published. And uh, it was su dietary supplements for hearing loss and tinnitus. And of all the ingredients that were in the combined ingredients of all of those 45 products, only about 10% of them had published research. And most of them were for Meniere's disease. And most of them were more than 10 years old. So well, and some, some of those things were, uh, were, were pretty wacko. I mean, everything from ginkgo tree bark to, uh, to other oh, weird yeah. kinds Siberian of things. Siberian ginseng. Uh, okay. You know. Yeah, right. So, so here's so, what I did. Okay. I put my science hat on. I contacted arbitrarily 25 companies by mail, not email, by mail. And, uh, and I told them who I was. I wasn't going to hide anything. And they said, like, just, who's on your advisory board? Who's making the decision to put this in? And can I have the reference list? And by the way, do you have any longitudinal data on the success of the product? Two companies responded to me. One said, we're too busy to answer your question. The other one said, oh, we're going to take it off the market anyway. That was it. Okay. So finding out through the, uh, through the FDA, dietary supplements are classified as food. And because they're classified as food, they don't have to go through the scrutiny of a pharmaceutical for uh, evidence-based research. They don't have to do that. Wow. So tongue in cheek, I used to tell in my lectures that my mother's spaghetti sauce from her mother's recipe from the Italian lady from Jersey City Cures tinnitus, okay? <laughs> All I have to do is make sure that what's in the jar is on the label. I don't have to prove efficacy and safety. Wow. Okay, so what I would do is I would ask anybody if they want the recipe, just send me 1995, I'll send you a wooden spoon, and I'll send you the recipe, you know? <laughs> sounds, like a, sounds like a great cure for tinnitus to me, which is as good as many of the cures that are out there online and various other places. None uh, of them are FDA approved. There are no there are no dietary supplements that are FDA approved for tinnitus. There's no diet. There's no dietary supplements uh, for COVID nineteen. 
Um, side effects, no dietary supplements, FDA approved for cognitive disorders. Okay, this uh, it, it's, it's not the Wild West. It's just that the FDA says that whatever you have in your in, in your pill or gel cap, whatever, the ingredients have to be listed. And lots of times they'll give you the minimal daily requirement and there's always an asterisk. And the asterisk on the bottom of small print says uh, the minimum daily requirements have not been established. So why wow. are you taking this? Now I have patients that have said, oh, but it helps. It helps, okay, my, my tinnitus is, you know, hasn't gotten worse. It's, it's, as a matter of fact, it's better. And on the outside, so people. Saying, on the outside, I'm saying, well, I'm glad you found relief. But on the inside, I'm saying, I have no clue what happened. <laughs> <laughs> and so, here's the drug guru from audiology saying, I don't have a clue what happened. I, on the inside, and no, Bob. You can I'm bet the rest the of it didn't know. Yeah. yeah, outside. So, so well, this, hey, is uh, open yeah. Area. this is an open yeah. area of research for our colleagues. Okay, Are you interested? Because, you know, there are people that, that believe in dietary supplements. I did some lectures on CBD oil, and, and, and that's the same situation. It's a plant-based product, so it's not FDA regulated other than, you know, making sure that what's in the, in the bottle is on the label and vice versa. Efficacy and safety do not have to be uh, proven because it's a plant-based product. It's food, okay? Yeah. So, uh, so caveat emptor, bar beware, okay? And if it's working for you, I'm glad you found relief. If you ask me how it's working for you, mm, I have no clue. <laughs> well, no clue. You, so we, you've you yeah. But Bob, it's a $19 billion a year industry. Keep that in oh, mind. Oh, wow. Dietary supplements are a 19, it's probably higher now, billion dollar a year industry. Sounds like you really need to market the spaghetti sauce on this one. Uh, hey, you know, the comedian to, uh, George Carlin said it the that. best. George Carlin said it the best. He goes, if you take two boards and you nail them together, you market it just right, someone will buy it. <laughs> That's probably yeah, very we much We all true. had pet rocks in the 1970s, didn't we? Yeah, really. Now that, that, I never did understand that one. But, well, <laughs> hey, we've, you know. we've kind of kind of talked a little bit about some of the some of the things that have happened. You mentioned the, the – 2013 Alumnus of the Year Award from Salus University. Yeah. Um, and uh, let's take a couple of minutes and kind of go over some of the some of the fabulous awards that our colleagues have actually bestowed, uh, like the 2020 Clinical Excellence Award in Audiology from the American Academy of Audiology, mm -hmm. uh, the Pharmacology Task Force, which you led from 2018 to 2019, and and the Pharmacology Education for Audiologists from the American Academy in 2018. Uh, also, uh, a uh, audiology education committee, which probably did a lot to build pharmacology in the in the various programs that that offer those those uh, those kinds of courses now in 2015, and so. Uh, so, so I guess that if you have some comments about those awards, th those are great awards for someone who has taken the time, energy, and effort. And although a lot of the things that we end up doing is kind of by accident, however, uh, uh, it, it is it is totally fitting that the Academy has presented you with some of these distinguished uh, honors. So, well, I, I was I was flattered when. I was selected uh, for this. And, um, you know, one of the things that you're looking at the growth of audiology and where it's going as a profession. And, you know, there's been a lot of emphasis, you know, with private practitioners, a lot of emphasis on the different hearing aid technologies and so on. And, you know, our diagnostic hats uh, sometimes have to be dusted off a little bit more. Uh, when we did the pharmacology education survey um, um, uh, about two years ago, um, with Nancy McKenna and, and Colleen Lapel and uh, Sam Atchison and, uh, and Dana Littman. Um, what we tried to do uh, was to, we surveyed all of the audiology doctoral programs and uh, only about a third of them are offering a dedicated pharmacology class uh, and the others are not. And, and that was surprising considering the AUD is 22 years old. 
Okay, 23 years old. And, uh, you know, the future of audiology, you know, is not just in the hearing aids uh, in cochlear implants, which is wonderful. There's nothing wrong. You know, that's, that's excellent. The thing here is that, you know, what about prescriptive rights? What about being able to write a prescription? Okay, I'm not saying for, you know, heavy duty narcotics and stuff, but what about a contact lesion from, a, from an ear mold or a hearing aid? Or what about an otitis externa? Or what about a script to write it for an MRI? Okay, I mean, yeah, we have the knowledge. We have the knowledge. But what happens here is that, you know, state licensing boards, you know, when you're looking at opening up your statute to expand your scope of practice, they're going to ask you, well, do you have a, a, a state organization? Well, how many members do you have? Well, I grant you some states have smaller numbers of audiologists. Like New Jersey's got like 500 audiologists. You know, so you know, do all 500 audiologists belong to your association? Do all 40 audiologists in your state belong to your? So the numbers have to be there. The numbers have to be there. And and for those that are watching this, you know, get involved with your state academy. Get involved with your state speech and hearing association. It's imperative if you want to have this as part of your future. And our profession deserves to have it because we are the experts in hearing and balance, uh, diagnostics and intervention and rehabilitation. Um, we need to have that type of a base. But right now, the doctoral programs are not consistent with a pharmacology education. Some of them lump it in. Some of them have pharmacology ototoxicity. Some of them have just ototoxicity and they talk about pharmacology, but they talk about ototoxic drug man ototoxic management, ototoxic monitoring. And that's all well and good. That's wonderful. Uh, but but there's some other basic things in pharmacology that we're looking at, you know, when it comes to um, medications that are being used for cognitive dysfunction. We're seeing, you know, the literature is showing that long COVID, the patients that are long haulers, uh, those that are been diagnosed, they were told they had brain fog. Okay, these are cognitive problems. There are medications that are being uh, given for this. Why can't an audiologist prescribe something like that? Okay, that's a rhetorical question. We need to have that solid backup. One course in pharmacology is not going to do it. Okay, one course in pharmacology, you know, just it, it, it's like the appetizers. You haven't got to the main course yet. And I think right now that's where the future has to be in the development and the and the improvement of pharmacology classes to be more expansive, to be more uh, uh, inclusive and to work with allied health professions and nursing, optometry, you know, to follow those models on their education in pharmacology and how we can model that. In New Jersey, it took the optometrists 20 years and about a half a million dollars in lobbying costs to get optometry prescriptive rights for eye drops. Okay, now try and think of what it would take for eardrops for an otitis externa. Okay, you have to be all in. My message to my colleagues that are watching this is that you have to be all in. You have to get everybody motivated that want to do this. And if audiology is a part-time thing and you don't have any skin in the game, you may not be motivated. Okay, and that's the challenge that that we have. And I think that if we're able to um, get our profession together to really look at pharmacology as a as a critical part of our training and a critical part of what we do in pharmacological management. You know, we're going to be the profession will be better, and the and our colleagues will be better individually to better manage their patients. I can think of many times, as as I'm sure you have in in your practice, in, in my in my practice, where, geez, how come I have to send somebody over to to uh, to the E and T guy to get some eardrops when you know, you know, you know really well that that's going to work for them. But I can't do anything about it. I got to send them over there. They got to, they have to get there. They have to be seen and admit and, and evaluated and this and that. And they say, oh yeah, you need some, you need some of these, which we could have handled real easily in, in our clinics them. easily. Yeah. Well, and, Bob, uh, you know what's interesting? I look at it this way. The audiologist owns the outer ear. The ENT owns the middle ear and the surgeons own the inner ear. <laughs> okay. okay. So well, there's your turf bore. <laughs> okay. Yeah, well, and and there really isn't any turf war with the middle really, ear and no. the and the inner ear, you know, the, on the medical kinds of things, and and I don't think any of us want to uh, want to compete with our ENT colleagues no, in those at areas all. at all. We just want to be able to have 
some autonomy in how we practice and, and that kind of thing. So I might also mention that you've uh, you've had the New Jersey Academy of Audiology Distinguished Clinical Service Award and a number of other kinds of things. You're president of that group and really a spearhead with the with the New Jersey Academy for many many years. Um, and and I think another another award that is certainly worth mentioning uh, is the Joel Warnick Award from the Academy of Doctors of Audiology, which which basically says Okay, here's a guy who's in practice and has all these kinds of things that are, are significant contributions to the profession. And I think all of us uh, would uh, give a big round of applause for all the work that has been conducted uh, with you, even though, you know, a lot of us end up with all these things happening to us and get interested and move on. And so kind of semi by accident. Uh, this all uh, is is a lot of hard work, energy, and effort that and and it takes a lot of 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 interest and and uh, digesting a lot of information and presenting it to us to tell us just how important it is. And uh, and on behalf of the profession, uh, we want to thank you for that as well. But I understand that. After 46 years in audiology, you know, uh, it, it, it's kind of like uh, going back to that band and the acting and the this and that. But uh, you kind of decided to move on in addition to some of the lecturing that you still do uh, through giving lectures on giraffes and rhinos and uh, things like that at, at the Safari Off-Road Adventure Park. Yeah. Six Flags Great Adventure here in New Jersey is about 15 minutes from my house, and they've been there for like the last 50 years. And I don't think there isn't anybody in New Jersey that hasn't been to Six Flags. But they have a 350-acre safari park, and they used to have a drive-through safari, but now they have uh, these uh, these these converted uh, large trucks that hold like 30 people. It's it's open air, and they've got the driver up front, and they got the tour guide in the back, and just talking about the animals from. Oh, there's like 1,200, 1200 animals from you know, like 50 different species of animals from six continents, and it's a you know it's a 45 minute tour, and we just educate everybody. And guess who's in the back with his Dr. Bob name tag on? <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's like the when I first started, it was like the best ten dollar ten dollar an hour job I ever had. And I would tell people I would pay them ten dollars an hour to do this job. No, it is fun. It, it's so not audiology. I asked the veterinarian about hearing loss in these exotic animals and stuff. And I said, Well, what happens in the wild when you have an animal that has a hearing problem? And he said, They get eaten. And I said, Okay, <laughs> that makes a lot of sense. Duh. <laughs> Well, so, as as we it's, it's as, just fun. Yeah. It's just... and and I don't know any other audiologists that are talking that are that are driving around in in these things that look like military trucks and mm -hmm. uh, talking to audiences about all these different things. Uh, uh, so it looks like it's a, a beautiful diversion from some of the serious things that you've been uh, performing in your career. As I as I tell as I tell my friends. It's the most non-audiology thing I've ever done. And uh, it's therapy. It really is. It's it's just fun. It was interesting. They asked me in the interview when I first got the job, they said, do you have any difficulty speaking into a microphone? <laughs> said, I don't think you know me that well. <laughs> no, so it's, as, it's fun. Yeah. It's, a, it, it's great therapy. It's just a lot of fun. It gets me out of the house a couple of days a week for a bunch of hours and uh and, and you know each tour is different the animals are just wonderful a lot of them on on endangered species okay i'm going to do a plug here the giraffe went on the endangered species list about three years ago they estimate oh the wow years there'll be no more giraffes in africa okay Ooh. because of poaching okay and, and sport hunting and uh, so but in the safari parks around the world they're thriving so they slowly reintroduce the animals after a period of time see if they thrive, you know? So, um, you know, there's, there's all sorts of things going on here, but come to New Jersey, come to the Six Flags, come to the off-road adventure and uh, check with me first to make sure that I'm working. <laughs> okay. Well, now let's uh, uh, just take the last few minutes here. And I have a little segment. I, I, I kind of ask people, what's the coolest moment to date in audiology for you uh, as a, as a person who, you know, 
struggled to get your, your orientation to the profession, worked through the doc program, found some fabulous, interesting things uh, that, that all of us really appreciate. Uh, plus, uh, now we even know the giraffes are on the endangered species list as well. And uh, so what's the coolest moment in audiology, at least till now? I think for everybody, it's watching the faces light up when you turn those hearing aids on and you reconnect these people to their families. You get the babies to smile. You get the par- the parents crying that the kids can hear. Um, letting Hearing parents say, I thought my child had other neurological problems. No, it's just, just hearing loss. And I don't want to say just hearing loss. I mean, it's hearing loss. This is the reason why. And you just never forget those events. And, and everybody's got stories about, you know, the, the smiling faces, the tears, uh, the fruit baskets, you know, all the gifts that would come through later on, uh, just any ways in which you provided some type of help uh, to uh, to bring a quality of life back to these patients who were disconnecting themselves or have already disconnected themselves from their family, but especially with the kids. And, and being in the New Jersey area, there's a lot of celebrities here in New Jersey. And every once in a while, we get some celebrities that pop in. And uh, of course, of HIPAA, I cannot say who they are, but uh, you think of all the famous celebrities in New Jersey, it's a good chance that you'll pick out several of them that have been in my office and so on. And they're just, just nice people. Usually it's their kids that are there, but, you know, we try and get, uh, we try and get people in, uh, get entire bands in, you know, we try and get, uh, we get people out of the opening acts for major performers and stuff. Uh, we get like, you know, I remember I had I had an offshore boating racing team. And uh, so they all wanted green earplugs for their right ear and red earplugs for their left ear because those are the <laughs> colors of the lights on the boats. You know, green is left and uh, red. And you right. would appreciate that as a Navy guy. Absolutely. Oh, I was in my yeah. and, and And probably the, 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 the best experience I had, you know, in Colts Neck nearby here, there's a Navy SEAL team at the time that was that was stationed there. And I got a call from them and that they needed custom ear molds made for their radios. And uh, so there's about seven or eight of them. And we made arrangements for them to come in after hours. They come in in their civilian clothes, you know, and they're nicest people, right? Knowing that they can kill you when you won't even know you're dead, but that's a different <laughs> story. And so we did the ear impressions and, you know, and so I got the eight pair of ear impressions. And two weeks later, I called them up and I said, hey, got the impressions. Let's all set something up. How about Thursday? And they said, that's great. We're going on a, you know, we're going on a, a, a practice mission and so on. We really could use it. I said, well, why don't you come on at about 7.30 in the morning? My office was in a medical complex on a Thursday. Now, think about the scenario. Medical offices, Thursday, 7.30 in the morning. They pull up. They come on in. They're in full battle gear, Bob. Okay. <laughs> they got everything with the makeup on. Okay. They got their bulletproof vests. <laughs> These guys were big. They come in. You know, we fit them all up and so on. And they were very appreciative. And they leave. And as they're leaving, I looked outside in the parking lot. Not a car in the parking lot. <laughs> this is 8 o'clock, 8.15 in the morning on a Thursday. There's not a car in the parking lot except the big van that they came in. What's on side of the van? United States Navy Weapons Ordnance Disposal Unit. The bomb squad. <laughs> not even the free old police showed up. <laughs> the parking lot was empty because the, something's going on. <laughs> and, and everybody well, went say- to 7-Eleven and they, they came back later on when the truck left. I thought it was this great experience. Absolutely wonderful. Well, but but the last thing we have to talk about here, Bob, is uh, from from a giant's point of view, uh, specifically with pharmacology and supplements and some of the research and so on that you've done. Um, what, where do you see the profession going, and what kind of a future do you see for audiology? I see audiology still following the medical model and getting more involved. I I. I uh, you know, that right now, the, the hearing aid is the center of the universe for audiology. Uh, diagnostics uh, are a major player. Rehabilitation, hearing loss is forever in most cases. I get it. I understand it. And I have no problem with that. But uh, I, I really think that the diagnostic hat sometimes is not really on properly. Um, because why aren't you looking at these drug side effects? Or maybe you're not. The drug list has to be updated. The supplement list has to be updated. I, I, I'm hoping that someone would step up to reach out to me and say, hey, I'm really interested. I, I really want to do this and, and, and then take it to the next level. 
We need to have the support of the profession within the state organization, state speech and hearing, state academies of audiology. Get involved, and, you know, and, and look at your license. And, and 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 again, opening a statute is a lot of time, effort, energy, and money. And you need the numbers. You need the numbers. You need the membership to do that. So I, I see the profession of audiology still being where we were 30 years ago as far as diagnosticians, rehabilitation specialists. And, and experts in balance, but expanding it with the technology that we have and, and contributing to that. And, and, and I'd like to see more people getting involved in the educational side of managing these kids in school. So the speech pathologists, the, the audiologists that are doing auditory processing will want to do it. The way you go about it, the way I went about it, I contacted all the schools in my area, spoke to the speech pathology people, went to their meetings and said, what do you want from me? Because I can dictate stuff and tell you to get this equipment, that equipment, but what's going to work? You know the politics. You know what's going on in your school system. What do you want from me? And you tailor your auditory processing program around the needs of the schools as opposed to the schools finding what, what you want them to do. Because what you want them to do is going to cost them more money than what they want you to do. And we all know about budgets. And I had a child study team director tell me a long time ago, he goes, Bob, they pay me to say no. I said, okay, I'm going to remember that for a long time. Of course. Well, uh, thanks so much for being with us, uh, Bob. We really appreciate your time, energy, and effort uh, that went into to our preparation for our, our uh, discussion today. Thank you. And, and to, the, to the group that's out there, uh, thank you for tuning in this week to uh, this week's discussion with a giant in audiology. My guest has been Dr. Robert Desbilgra, former owner, audiology associate in Freehold, New Jersey, and adjunct professor of audiology at many universities, the person who taught audiology about pharmacology. And of course, he's your audiologist at the Animal Park, a true giant in audiology. Thanks for your fabulous contributions to our profession, Bob. And next time, be with me when we get to know another giant in audiology. Thank you, Bob. It's been a pleasure and an honor. I really appreciate it. Thank you.